Michael Corman uh, here with uh, some of his clients. If you'd uh, please come forward and uh, begin when you're ready. Good afternoon. My name is Michael Camorn. I'm a uh, criminal defense lawyer. I've been practicing for about 25 years. I'm also the president of the Michigan Medical Marijuana Association. I want to thank the chairman and the Judici Judiciary Committee and uh, Representative Lucido for championing this important cause that, uh, from my personal experience as a lawyer, has uh, been quite brutal on the citizens of Michigan. Um, with me are uh, two clients of mine that I've represented in uh, court proceedings. Both I would describe as being victims of both the Michigan Medical Marijuana Act um, bad interpretations and also forfeiture law. Uh, and we've submitted to, for review, I have like an index of various events that have taken place in some cases that I think evidence or should uh, hopefully convince you that there are some real problems with the existing forfeiture law. And I want to just point out there's some very unusual things that are unique to forfeiture law that are uncommon to the principles of governance that we, we understand. Like the Michigan Medical Marijuana Act, um, there's this concept of immunity and in, 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 in forfeiture there's this concept of constitu constitutionally protected property. And what unfortunately happens is both the person's immunity and their right to property is determined at the time by the police without any kind of due process. In other words, there's unlike a driver's license or some other entitlement that the government gives, there's no hearing between a neutral detached magistrate. To get a search warrant, we require a independent, neutral, not the police making the decisions when they can go into a home. This does not take place with forfeiture. They're inside of a home, they're executing a search warrant, and it is they that decide what property is subject to forfeiture. And they also decide that the person is outside of compliance with the Michigan Medical Marijuana Act, which is not always the case. And the reason why these individuals are here is really to emphasize the point that the, they are people that have, were charged with crimes and utilized the Michigan Medical Marijuana Act to defend and or uh, have the charges dismissed. And independent of that, they still were victims of forfeiture. Ms. Jocelyn had her house uh, forfeited with the Attorney General's office, and it turned out a year later when she was charged criminally, it was an illegal search warrant that uh, was found and in, in all the evidence in the criminal case was thrown out. Had this law been in effect, she would not have been subject to that particular uh, forfeiture of her home. Mr. Fisher um, defended himself under Section 8 of the Michigan Medical Marijuana in Isabella County. Um, there was a forfeiture proceeding that had been stayed pending the outcome of the criminal case. The criminal case resulted in a dismissal of all charges. The MMA says if you prevail under Section 8, there shall be no forfeiture. And when we went to try to get the property returned, the prosecutor's office filed a motion to recuse the judge recused the judge because one time, 17 years ago, the judge made a negative comment about forfeiture. Things are getting strange and things are very unusual amongst government officials in this arena. And, and after litigating that and having the court find that the judge should not be disqualified, we got an order to return the property. My client went out to return the property and they still haven't returned all of the property. This is um, abnormal behavior. There are things that I think most citizens wouldn't expect to happen. Oftentimes I have to explain to clients not just why the law, uh, the police think they violated the Michigan Medical Marijuana Act, but I have to explain to them the forfeiture law, how they have to fight to get back their property. So, I'm, so I, I, I want to have my, my clients speak as to their, their experience, but um, from my perspective, my experience is that there is a rampant abuse, and I think the statistics speak for themselves. 2000, uh, 12, $25 million brought in on forfeiture proceeds in this last year reporting $15 million. I, I always understood that the legislature was the one that created the budget, had the purse strings. I don't know of any other government agencies that are given a budget and then go out and earn money on top of that and use the money for their own purposes. And that is the system that's been set up. So let my, uh, I'd like to let my clients speak a little bit and I would encourage you to uh, vote in favor of passing this bill. Hi, thank you to the committee for hearing us today. My name's Amanda Jocelyn. I'm a, I'm, I'm a caregiver, I'm a patient. 
I'm a mother, daughter, neighbor, and a friend. I'm a law-abiding law citizen, and I'm also a victim of policing by profit. My son and myself were raided, jailed, and prosecuted by the state for medical marijuana and some of the same behavior that is currently being licensed. The activities are being licensed current, right now. I'm in support of the Bill 4158. In 2015, after receiving local approval, the state of Michigan raided my home, seized my property, money, closed my businesses, took my cars, home, computers, my kids' game systems, um, my son had been saving his, his uh, paycheck since he was 17. He was 21 when this happened, and all of that was gone. Um, and you tell a 21-year-old something like that, um, you know, I'm sorry, but the police and the government won't give our stuff back. Um, and this was all prior to us being charged, by the way. Um, when when the uh, forfeiture took place, there were two separate cases, the criminal and the civil. Um, the civil had already been given away by the time the criminal case had been concluded, which, as Mr. Comorn mentioned, it was dismissed for a violation of civil rights. So, or, excuse me, Fourth Amendment. So, um, you know, I see, I see that there are staggering statistics out there on the arrest rates for rape at 14 percent, murder rate, arrest rate is at 30 percent, and then the drug arrests are at 80 percent. And we, we take a look at that and we wonder what the motivation is. Well, we can't take money from a sexual offender. We, we can't take money from a murderer. But we can, however, take money from the low-hanging fruit, which is the medical marijuana community, and seize all their assets. <clears throat> We have individuals that are participating in a consensual act, and they're being wiped out financially, emotionally, spiritually, just broken. No means of hiring attorneys or even feeding their children. And um, again, there's no money to prosecute or to arrest rapists or murderers, so the low-hanging fruit is what is picked. My two sons and myself are three of the many Michigan residents that fell victim of policing by profit and we are victims of the drug war. Interestingly, many of which, not only myself, um, in many cases, these, these folks are never charged with a crime. However, all of their things that they've worked for for so many years are just gone. Um, and imagine, if you will, having a complete stranger go and rifle through your closet, your drawers, every little private nook in your home, and just throw it all over the place and then take and pick and choose what they'd like to take home with them. They, they took even a steam mop, a steam mop. And all of this was based on an illegal search warrant and they took all of that. Um, to this day, my son struggles with severe anxiety. He struggles with depression. He was 21 at the time this happened. He's 24 now, and he still has not recovered. Um, passing this bill is going to help to mitigate the law-abiding citizens of Michigan, the good citizens, good people of Michigan, from facing the devastation that civil asset forfeiture brings forward. Thank you for your time, and we rely on you to make Michigan a safer place in that regard. Thank you. I believe we have a question from Representative Lafave. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And Miss, I'm so sorry to Ms. hear. Miss Jocelyn. Yeah. Miss Jocelyn, I'm so sorry to hear that this happened to you. Thank you. Um, I'd like to know when the property was seized, uh, at what point and, and what portions have you had returned to you, and how long did it take to get any, if uh, to get all, if if any, of that back? It's more of a procedural issue. If I could, it, the, the Raid took place. She was served with the forfeiture action to attempt to seize her home and the contents therein. I was not represented at the time, and there was no insight, any criminal charges, or they weren't. No, we weren't notified. They weren't notified that it was going to happen. She ultimately settled with the prosecuting attorney's office and walked away with whatever she could. But she had to give up her home. She had to pay another ten thousand dollars when they uh, when her home was sold, and. Um, the proceeds of which went to the state of Michigan. So it wasn't until a year later 
that the criminal charges were brought, and we could, and we, and then I began representing her, and we defended, and it turned out there was an illegal uh, search warrant. And if you so, can, oh, please. I'm sorry. Uh, so none of the things came back. Um, they, they were, they're gone because there's a separate proceeding. And then, if I may, is, there was no percentage in that settlement that you had. There was no percentage of, like, being able to get the, your son's piggy bank back or it was anything like that. Unreasonable. Nothing of nothing of substance. You know, she gave up her house. You might have got your mop back, but you didn't get your car. I didn't get no nothing actually. Mop so it was unreasonable terms that were put forth, and after being devastated like that financially, and y there's not really a means to pick up and pay more. Y you're paying for legal fees and uh, all of these other things that go along with living expenses. I didn't have money for my house payment. Uh, if even if. I had nothing. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for sharing your story with us today. Thank you very much. Uh, do we have additional testimony, or? Steve Fisher just wanted to comment if you could. Sure. Okay. Uh, Representative Cole does have a question. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <coughs> what was your what year was the uh, was the uh, uh, a search warrant issued? 2015. 2015. 2015. What was your primary income source in 2015? Um, I did. I had a, a doctor's office that I ran. Okay. Right. And I had a few other income streams in addition to that. Self okay. But the, the reason I ask, if I may, Mr. Chair, is uh, um, I believe the original way that the medical marijuana bill was written, that it was uh, not to uh, be profitable, if you will, when you're providing for patients. That's why I asked about that. So that wasn't your sole source of income? It was not. No, it was not. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Go right ahead. Thank you. Thank you for your time today. Uh, just like to say a few words in support of Bill 4158. Uh, like those before me, I'm also a victim of civil asset forfeiture as of April of 2016. I'm 51 years old, and my name is Steve Fisher. Uh, my wife, Leslie Fisher, is also included in this. We were raided in April of 2016, and the cops proceeded to take a bunch of our property, things that they deemed were of value to them. Um, a little bit about myself. Uh, I ser served in the Army from 1985 to 89, and shortly after that, I started my own business, a landscape company, which I ran for 19 years after that and then uh, I sold that business in 2013 and since then I'm, I've been running uh, electronics recycling business uh, so I've been a little self-sufficient you know with uh, feeding my family taking care of ourselves paying the bills uh, my wife worked at the casino for over 22 years and uh, so, so you know, when, when I served in the military, I gave the United States a blank check with my name on it, and that check said, cash at will. And I was better for the service to my country. I'm proud of it, and proud of what all of it stands for. So for me to have to sit here and explain that the, the civil asset forfeiture law is flawed, that it needs fixed, that the execution of it has been abused by law enforcement and that prosecutors vigorously fight to try and keep my property even after a dismissal is quite disturbing to me. Uh, my wife and I didn't even have our day in court, but yet we were being punished prior to that in the sense that they take your property, albeit economically. Um, they were supposed to take things that they believed were linked to a crime. A perfect example of how law enforcement's total disregard for this is the fact that they took a car that I bought brand new in 1987. The car had less than 30,000 miles on it, and the last time it was plated was in 2009 or 2010. So I, I can't get my head around how they justify taking property like that. that has nothing to do with 
anything. Um, so, uh, and I guess I need to mention that me and my wife were medical marijuana patients and I was her caregiver. I didn't caregive for anyone else at the time. Um, so, uh, another thing I wanted to add too is back when this happened, we also had to pay the bond that they were allowed to put on the property at the time just so we could have our day in court to fight to get our property back. And again, I'd like to thank you guys for this time. And I am in support of Bill 4158. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, any questions? I, Representative LaFave. <coughs> Sir, I, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Sir, I thank you for your service to our country. Um, we, we can't have hearings like this without brave women, men and women willing to pay the ultimate sacrifice. Um, if you're not comfortable answering, answering any of these questions, totally understand. Um, just background uh, about how many plants did you have in the house and approximately what items, the laundry list of such, did they take from your home? And last question is what, if anything, did you get back at the end of it? Right. It's a very good question. I'd like to answer just in this regard. And this is a, the, the point I was trying to make because your question would suggest, well, maybe the police were justified in doing what they did if he was way outside of his compliance or whatnot. And right? I don't mean to suggest that in any way. Understood. And I think it's an important point <coughs> to make, which is that the decision of this noncompliance is being done by the police, who, if they make that determination, the individuals are no longer immune. And the way the law has been interpreted is that marijuana is still illegal in the state of Michigan unless you're immune from it because you fit this narrow category and volume limitations. Now, the volume limitations, which was the issue in this particular case, deals with a specific term of art, which is usable marijuana. I'm familiar. It's got to be dried. Yeah. Now, when a patient harvests two, three, four, five plants of the 12 or up to 72 that they have, they've got soaking wet plant-like material. Law enforcement does not contemplate this. They call it processed. I remember at a Judiciary Committee in 2011, when Representative Horn asked someone from the Michigan State Police, in light of the, the definition of usable marijuana, what does the Michigan State Police have to say of that? And they said, we do not have a comment. Okay, now, the significance of that was the issue of usable marijuana remained elusive. It was not defined. And therefore, this wet plant material, you could go in and say it weighed 20 pounds, which is what is common. I have hundreds of cases like this, when in fact, it wasn't dry. It was not ready for use. and the purpose of the law was to protect people from arrest, not create nuances that, you know, exceptions that could pull people out of their immunity. And, and that is unfortunately what has been happening. You wouldn't see an increase in arrests of marijuana 14% uh, percent every year and 15 million in, in proceeds when you have a state <coughs> law that was intended to stop that behavior. I mean, the legislature in 2016 amended the law retroactively, I've never seen this before in 25 years of practicing law, retroactively to cure what, they've been, what the legislature has been unable to do, which is to protect patients from getting arrested. I mean, that's a declaration that the law has not worked with its original intention. And the uh, statistics show it, because you've got an increase in funds and an increase in arrests. So the point is that the allegations through the eyes of law enforcement are not, you know, and again, I'm, it's, a, it, it, it's not their fault, I would even say. They were not educated on this. It's a new area of, you know, and that's been a, a, an unfortunate fact. but. These things that I'm talking about have been used, unfortunately, to uh, promulgate and increase the forfeiture proceeds. Um, but those, those, the allegations were, of course, about um, issues of usable marijuana. You know, they find them on a drying rack, intending to be drying, not dried. So things like that have been, you know, play on words to pull people out of immunity. And it is a good point and very good question. Thank you. Well, it's a, it's a section four, not section four. If you're out of Section 4, then they see it as a free-for-all. That's true then also. They, then they okay. hit you hard. And it's like Section 4 exists, Section 8 does not exist. Well, if um, well, let's, let's, um, let's skip that. Then if, if you don't mind, just briefly give me the, the list of property that was seized and what, if any, was returned. Uh, they took uh, 2,000 Cadillac Eldorado, 2009 Chevy Silverado, the 1987 Buick Grand National, uh, all my guns, six guns, all the ammo, uh, gold and silver that I had in the house from my recycling business, 
that I reclaim myself from circuit boards. Uh, a, a trailer, 14 foot enclosed trailer with snowmobile in it. Uh, all the grow equipment that I had, I also had a uh, um, uh, extraction equipment to make concentrates. Uh, and we had, the list goes on. So, you know, it was it was things of value, and things that were easy to take. They just cherry picked us, and we ended up getting all the vehicles back, the enclosed trailer, the snowmobile, uh, some power tools, my cordless drill, table saw, um, uh, two computers. Funny thing is, is they took. Uh, a computer out of my house I had in my office in the house I have two desks I have one desk is I do everything but pretty much email on that so I got some computer games on there they took my gaming rig and left the computer that I do all my emailing on okay we, we got to move along we had a number of uh, additional people Thank to you. testify uh, if there's no additional questions or uh, representative Cole what year was the uh, was was the search warrant and the item saved? Two thousand sixteen. Two thousand sixteen. Uh, and we just uh, yeah, that was, yeah. what was it December twentieth? I think it was. We just got some of the stuff back, but the court order was to return all the property, all seized property. Mm -hmm. um, Prosecutors <coughs> it back to us. Currently under law, is it legal to possess marijuana and firearms at the same time? Well, that's a good question. You know the. MMA um, keeps private the names of uh, the registry of who are the patients. And um, there is a, uh, obviously a uh, Second Amendment right to possess. A, a, I know that the ATF has commented on this um, under the pretext that under federal law, all Schedule One drugs are, uh, you know, addictive. And so but what I'm getting at is there, there maybe was just cause to retain some of that property during the, 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 the search of that and that some of that was obtained potentially with monies derived from the sale of marijuana. Is that, I, I'm just trying to wrap no, my I'm head saying, around the whole scenario here. Saying, but you have to understand what I just answered is the ATF under federal law. This is the state of Michigan. They have a medical marijuana act and the state just but the scheduling, laws. the scheduling, sir, of drugs at the federal level level supersedes the state. Yeah, but this is a state court we're in. It's the state okay. laws right. we're under. It's not a federal prosecution. Understand? They don't apply federal law in state court. And the concept of that you're speaking of it being, you know, Schedule One is absurd. This legislature just passed a law where they're mm -hmm. going to receive tax money for selling this these things that this argument would lead to that my client was possessing and it's contraband may as well be kitty porn i mean that's that's the analogy was was extraction legal when the search warrant in michigan when the search warrant was issued that's a good question i, I don't know that it was ever illegal i know that there was an opinion about brownies but i would suggest that the preparation thereof of the michigan medical marijuana usable marijuana had has never been litigated now, I know law enforcement was arresting people if it wasn't plant material, but that was not a resolved issue. I would say brownies maybe, but that, that this legislature fixed. And the real answer is no, it wasn't because the law that you passed is retroactive. So the answer is no. When he was, when he was uh, possessing so-called extraction machine, asking me today, it was lawful because the law is retroactive. Another issue, too. Is right? They claim that was so. I'm just, I'm just thank you, Mr. Chair, for, for allowing this, but... Uh, uh, I'm just trying to wrap my head around if the law enforcement agents may have been acting in uh, lawfully uh, under what they uh, were under what they presumed was uh, was the intent of the law and, and how the law was written at that time that they made the uh, uh, the entry into the residence and, and uh, seized the property. Understood. His wife was not bound over, meaning the, meaning the charges were dismissed against her. So that would be the first answer to whether the law enforcement were acting appropriate. There was no okay. probable cause to find that crimes existed in, in the case. Now. Mr. Fisher's case, we had to litigate, and ultimately, it was uh, the court found that there was um, a medical use. The medical use defense um, was uh, found to result in the dismissal of the charges. But his his point is making that no one recognizes that there's this medical purpose, and if you prevail, then there is no forfeiture, and, and they're not contemplating that. Thank you. Thank you. 
Thank you very much. If there's no additional questions, uh, thank you for your testimony. <coughs> Next, we have uh, Ted Nelson of the Michigan State Police, retired, who uh, is supported the bill and would like uh, three minutes. Three minutes. <coughs> Mr. Chairman and uh, members of the judiciary, judiciary, I'd like to first say I, I gave a uh, my experience out to the clerk to show what my past has been with uh, my careers as well as um, the Michigan State Police uh, teaching in public education and so forth um, and also my experience with criminal uh, civil asset forfeiture. Um, I spent 26 years with the Michigan State Police and after I retired I spent 14 years in public education teaching criminal justice to high school students and I also taught uh, adjunct